Hey there, Vu. It's Pastor Rich coming to you from Miami, Florida. Now, don't click away just yet. Today's sermon, I feel, is going to bless you. But before we get to today's talk, I just want to share my thankfulness to you for being a part of the Vu friends and family. Each week, we see about 5,000 people step into our church. But really, Vu is so much more than just a place. It's a people. If there were no people, our church wouldn't exist. I know for me, God has given me such a love for the people of Miami. We as a church, we feel called to serve the city. We believe as we serve the city, God's going to change it. But I also believe that God has called Vu to reach the nations, to go global with our faith. And here's where you come in. We're in the middle of a collection of talks called Bricklayers, leading up to our annual offering on December 15th. Once a year, we as a church give generously, not to keep the lights on, but to further the vision that God has given us. And we believe with your help, we can go further faster. Today, I want you to consider partnering with Food Church. Go to foodchurch.com to see how you can be a part of our annual offering on December 15th. You may never step inside the walls of Vu, but you can help lay the foundation for those who will. Consider sowing a financial seed and help accelerate the vision at Vu Church. Now, let's get to today's talk. I really think it's gonna encourage you. I love you, Vu. I wanna welcome all of our VU friends and family who are joining us by way of podcasts or YouTube. Can we make some noise for all of our VU friends and family from really all over the world? This ministry isn't just making a local impact. I really believe it's touching the world and we're grateful for your support and your participation. Tonight, I wanna open up with Habakkuk chapter two, starting in verse two. Just really gives me a great thesis to work with, a great premise to work with. This is what the prophet Habakkuk says. Chapter two, verse two, out of the ESV version. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. See, so many people, because they lack vision, they can never start running. Many people, because they don't have any vision, they can't ever get some momentum going. They don't know where they're headed. He says, write it down, make it plain, make it clear. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. I don't know. That's been hitting me hard all day in the heart. Look at your neighbor and say, wait for it. Look at your other neighbor and say, no, for real, wait for it. Wait for it. I, I don't know who I'm speaking to tonight, but I got a feeling there's some people in this room that you feel like this season of life is slow. Can I encourage you? Can you let me pass to you for a moment? Wait for it. Don't you quit. Don't you give up. Don't you settle. Don't lower your standard. Now you've come too far to simply come this far. Wait for it. Wait for it. Woman of God, wait for a man of God. What? What? Don't you settle. You've waited this long. Wait for it. It's like you used to want a man who would carry his cross. Now you're like, it's cool if he just has a tattoo of a cross. I'm just need some. No. <laughs> Someone say, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. <sighs> can you let that just, can you let that minister to you for a moment? It will surely come. In fact, take your, your hand right now, put it over your heart. Say, it will surely come. Say it again, say, it will surely come. Encourage yourself, preach to yourself, minister to you. It will surely come. It will not delay. Wait for it. I want to take a few moments tonight, part two of our collection of talks, Bricklayers. I want to preach to you from the subject, waiting is working. Waiting is working. I believe God's presence is here. I believe the same power that's in this room is making its way through that podcast and through that YouTube channel. Someone's watching this right now at home on a Wednesday night at midnight, but God's about to speak to you in your bedroom. Waiting is working. Would you pray with me all over this room? Lord, we thank you so much that you're at work. So we rest in that today. We open up our ears. We open up our hearts tonight, Lord. We're asking that you would stir up our faith. Let us dream for more. Let us see more than what we see right now. God, I pray that you would give a revelation to this house, that God, we would lay our lives down for the gospel, that we would be bricklayers, brick by brick, person by person, sacrificing and generously giving that we might build your kingdom here on earth. Today, help us to see Jesus in a fresh way. 
Help us to leave this place different from how we walked in. Help us thinking more like Jesus, talking more like Jesus, becoming more like Jesus. This is our prayer tonight. We love you. We praise you in advance. And if you agree with that prayer, come on, all of God's people said? All of God's people said? I want you to take five seconds right now, and I want you to make as much noise as you possibly can for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Come on, somebody. Go ahead and let this place erupt in praise. Stir up your faith. Stir up your faith. Mm. I want to speak to you tonight around the topic of vision. We are in a collection of talks that's about our corporate vision for our congregation and for our church, but listen to me, this corporate talk also must begin to become an individual talk. You need a vision for your life. Vision is the ability to look into the invisible and to create and to see that which does not exist. I was thinking about my life. So much of the good things in my life were birthed out of vision. Like I got married because I had a vision. I remember I was 17, man. I was just kind of getting right with God. I was still learning to hear his voice. But I'm telling you, when I saw Don Cherie, Lene Duran, Jesus spoke clearly. I said, that's the one right there. Now, it took me a while to, to cast the vision to her. But your boy's not too bad of a leader. I can describe a vision all day. I got that girl. Hey, okay. Some of you dudes, you better cast a bigger vision, man. Two sons. We went on a journey of infertility. But I'm telling you, my family was a vision first. In our deepest valleys, in our darkest valleys, somehow still when I closed my eyes, even though I'd gotten the doctor's report, I could still see myself holding those boys. I'm telling you, when you have a vision, all of a sudden, all of the pain in your life now begins to have a purpose because you realize I'm not there yet. I'm on the way. I'm going to keep on believing. I'm not going to give up now. I'm going to wait for it. Habakkuk says, write the vision down. Make it plain. Make it clear. Visualize it. See it. Talk about it. Think about it. Share about it. This whole church, everything you're looking at tonight, like, I don't know, maybe it's your first week to boo, or maybe you've been here for two months. You're like, oh, I love this place. This is crazy. Look at all these people. Oh, my goodness. And the smoke and the arms in the air. It's kind of weird, but I like it. Um, Look at all these people. Where did everybody come? This is crazy. Oh 60,000. This church is rich. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but yo, that's not our story. Our story started four years ago in my apartment. And homie, we didn't have anything. We didn't have any money. We didn't have any resources. We didn't have a building. We lacked talent. We lacked a team. We didn't have very much, but there was one thing that we always had, and that was a vision of what could be. I'm trying to preach to you tonight. If all you got is a vision, you got enough. God can work through you. Come on, somebody give God some praise. God, give me vision. God, give me vision. Vision is all about this idea about seeing, seeing into the invisible. Why? Because often you have to see it before you receive it. Now, I'm not saying every time we serve the God who does exceedingly, immeasurably, more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. You serve the God not of karma. You serve the God of grace. Let me tell you all the karma people out there. You don't want what you deserve. Just... Side note, side note. It's the universe. I, you don't want the universe. You, you want grace. Because grace is not the proclamation that the good will be blessed. No, the, grace is the proclamation that even the bad will be blessed. Because if you put your trust in Jesus, all of a sudden, his blood covers your sin. His righteousness is imputed unto you. Grace is the proclamation that even if you're jacked up, guess what? Grace can meet your life. So I haven't seen everything before I received it. I, I, I saw sons. I did not see the most handsome, blue-eyed, blonde head. Who is this boy, Wyatt Wesley Wilkerson? That's just called grace. 
I, I saw a godly woman partnering with me. I did not see the bombshell. I, I can't even describe it by keeping it. I, I just got to watch my mouth. But my, my wife, that's called grace, baby. <laughs> He's a good God. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. I need to go home. Okay, Rich, stop. Sick. He always takes it too far. <laughs> Often yet you have to see it before you can receive it. We're talking for the next few weeks on the life of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is an Old Testament character and there's an entire book of the Bible given to him. I like Nehemiah for a lot of reasons, but one of the most basic reasons why I like him is because he's not a pastor, he's not a prophet, he's not like, in, he's not a miracle worker, he's a dude. In fact, he's a dude living in slavery who simply gets a vision and God fulfills the vision. Nehemiah, the context is, is that the year is around 444 BC and Nehemiah is in exile under the Persian Empire just some history, the Hebrew people were sacked three different times around 583 BC by the Babylonian empire. Three different times they would come in, they destroyed the temple, they destroyed the walls, and every time they would come, they would take people back to Babylon. That's where you get the stories in the Bible like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's where you hear about Daniel's story. It's called the exile. The exile is very encouraging though for Christians because as you study it, what you find is that many of these slaves, not only did they survive, they actually thrived. They actually made an impact in a heathen nation like Babylon. Well, how many of you know, if God was faithful to them in slavery, he will certainly be faithful to us in society. If God could use them back then, he can use us in Miami. He can use us in whatever city you live in. Yet Nehemiah is now living under the Persian Empire because the Persian Empire came, wiped out the Babylonian Empire. And the first trip back to Jerusalem was led by Emperor Cyrus and he sent a man by the name of Zerubbabel and he let him go back into Jerusalem to begin to rebuild the temples. Decades later is where Nehemiah's story picks up and Nehemiah is a cupbearer to a king. The king's name is Artaxerxes. This is a Persian king, and Nehemiah is a cupbearer to this Persian king. And here's where his story picks up because it starts out with a vision. Watch this. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3, a little bit of Bible study tonight. They said to me, this is Nehemiah, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah is serving and working underneath this king and he gets letters that the walls of Jerusalem have been broken down and torn down. And when he gets the news, he breaks down and he cries. You see, many times a God vision will be birthed out of brokenness. So often the thing that frustrates you the thing that concerns you, the thing that annoys you is actually the prompting of the Holy Spirit that he's pushing you to be the solution. What you must learn is that oftentimes frustration is an indication of what you're called to. You understand, you're never called to complain, by the way. That's another message. How do you know you're complaining? You know you're complaining when you're talking about the problem with no attempt to solve the problem. So many times what'll happen is you'll see something that is and it'll break your heart. It'll annoy you, it'll frustrate you. That shouldn't be, that's not right. It's a concern. And Nehemiah has a brokenness. He begins to weep. He's frustrated over this news. Our walls should not be torn down. This should not be the case. But this is the birth of a vision. This is a construction of a vision. Because vision often is this way. Vision is when frustration with what is creates passion for what could be. I have an expectation. My situation is this. The gap in between is the vision. Nehemiah gets this vision. And please understand, Nehemiah is not weeping over broken walls. Can we get this tonight? Nehemiah is weeping over broken people. His heart is not broken because of brick and mortar. His heart is broken for people that are outside of protection. Listen to me. 
Please get this in our hearts tonight. December 15th, when we receive the bricklayer's offering, we are not giving an offering to build a physical building. We're not giving an offering to construct brick and mortar. We're giving an offering because our heart breaks for a broken, destroyed city. And we believe Jesus still is the answer. We give out of brokenness. It's a really simple question tonight. Are you and God crying about the same things? Because we see in the Old Testament that God, he, he operates in sadness. He has emotions. We see in the New Testament, Jesus, Jesus weeps over the city of Jerusalem. Jesus is the true and better Nehemiah. Nehemiah is an outline. Nehemiah is a shadow of what is to come. But when Jesus weeps, he doesn't weep because the physical temple is broken. He weeps because people are lost. We didn't build this church for a big gathering. We built this church because we believe that this city is lost and it's dying. And if we don't step in and intervene, I don't know who will. This is our moment. This is our hour to build brick by brick. Come on, if you believe it, somebody give God a shout of praise. Nehemiah gets this vision. You're like, yo, what's he do? Let me tell you what he does. He waits. <laughs> what? He waits. This is so very, very important because many times what happens to us is that we get a vision from God and we think it requires immediate action. And what takes place is, is that we rush God. You have to learn how to trust the process and the timing of God. You don't want to rush the spirit. I'm telling you, there's nothing worse than getting the right thing at the wrong time. And many times when we step into a God vision too soon, it's like giving birth prematurely. The result is it's born weak. Nehemiah waits four months and he waits. Think about the Bible. Think about the case studies in the Bible. Think about Moses. Moses had to wait 40 years in the desert before his dream came to pass. Joseph gets a dream at 17. It takes two decades, not two days, not two weeks, two decades before he sees that thing come to pass. David, before he becomes a king, he has to wait year after year being a shepherd. By, I mean, by all comparison, Nehemiah got off much easier than Moses, but nonetheless, Nehemiah, after four months of waiting, and really you have to back it up before that, because year after year, he was working a job that probably appeared to him to be very senseless. I mean, talk about the worst job in the world. He's a cupbearer. You understand what that job is, right? A cupbearer means that your sole job is that any drink that comes to the king, you test it first with your own mouth, your own tongue. It goes down your throat. Why? You're testing for poison. How many of you know that when it's got poison, well, <laughs> we'd find out by you dying. Worst job ever. Yet I believe his story's in the Bible because it gives you and I hope because some of you right now, you're in a season that you're going to a job every day, you're showing up to a season that feels really slow, that seems really pointless. Yet I believe that Nehemiah gives hope because we serve the God that can take what appears to be pointless to you. And if you'll put your trust in him, he can add purpose to that season. Do you believe it tonight? Come on, somebody give God some praise in this place. Listen to me. A vision rarely requires immediate action. It always requires patience. It always requires patience. What happens to so many of us is so many of us, we hate waiting because we want to start working. And so many God visions die in the season of inactivity. Oh, this isn't right. This isn't right. This, oh, I, should, I, 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 gotta, I gotta do something. And so we, we step out and we start rushing and we're rushing and we're pushing and we're trying to push our agenda. I want to encourage you tonight that waiting on God is your job. I want to be so clear. You waiting on God is your job. <laughs> and how many of you know important jobs are rarely easy? So when you're waiting on God, it actually feels like hard work. Feels uncomfortable. Feels like you're clocking into a job that you don't want to clock into. 
It feels like you're getting paid minimum wage and you're putting out more effort than that. It feels awkward. It feels odd. It feels like work. That's what waiting is though. Waiting is, is working. But can I encourage you that on the flip side, that waiting works? Amen. <laughs> I'm gonna preach it how I feel it for a moment. I know that feeling of seeing something, hearing something, dreaming about something, but now I'm in the weight and the weight hurts and the weight is uncomfortable, but I gotta remind myself that my job is to wait on God. I don't wanna get in front of God, so I'm gonna do my job. My job is to wait and my job while I wait feels like work. But the good news is this, is that when I wait, it always works. It is proof positive that if you will wait on God, that he will renew your strength. He will cause you to rise up on wings like eagles. You will run and not grow faint. You will walk and not become weary because waiting is working. Come on, somebody give him some praise in this place. Oh, come on and give him praise all over this house. It's working. It works. Let me testify, it works. Wait on God, it works. Waiting is working. It feels like work, but it works. I think it's safe to say that your God vision is gonna take anywhere from four months to 40 years. <laughs> but you walk out of here saying, waiting is working. It's working while I wait. I'm working. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm working. You, you, you think I'm just waiting. I know I am waiting, but I'm working. <laughs> It's my job right now. I'm not really getting paid, but I'm getting paid in heaven. I'm, I'm working. And it, it works to wait. That when I, when I wait on him, it always works. That if God promises something, if I wait on him, he will deliver. The bigger the responsibility, the more preparation is required. Waiting is working. Yet to be very, very practical tonight, we're going to use the scriptures to help give us some handles. Because you're going, well, okay, great, okay, you're getting me a little bit rich, I'm, but what do I do? Because like, people all have different interpretations, right? Like, okay, I'm waiting, I just, I'm just on my mom's couch, just uh, waiting. <laughs> just, I'm in a waiting season, I'm in a holding pattern, you know? Christians say the weirdest metaphorical stuff. You're like, I don't understand, you know? I know I planted some seed last month. I'm hoping for a harvest. Like, but bro, are you a farmer? Like, you know. What, what, is it, what does it look like to wait? Because Nehemiah had two deep revelations that we see because it shows up in his life that I think should show up in our life that while we're waiting, waiting is working, but while I wait, that you need to get the same revelation. The first revelation is simply this. If life gets too hard to stand, kneel. Come on, we can do a little bit better. Come on, it's 7.15. Listen to me. Before you talk about it, I sure hope you've prayed about it. Before you tweet about it, pray about it. Before you announce it, pray about it. Before you gram it, pray about it. Prayer is what keeps a vision alive. Prayer has the ability to connect your heart to God. And when pressure begins to hit your life and when the brokenness in the weight of a vision makes it feel like it's too hard to stand, that's okay. Get on your knees because a vision expands in prayer. See, what God begins to do in prayer is God begins to show you a bigger vision. I've seen so many people, it's like they get a vision, a word from God, and they jump out and they run to it. And what happens is, is God was like, no, 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 like I just, I just showed you a scene. I wanted to show you the whole story, but you just took off in, in scene three. Like th there's more to it and you'll only discover it in prayer. Prayer helps you see things that you otherwise would miss. Um, my son, Wyatt, not even two years of age yet, um, all the parents that are in this room tonight will, will know my pain. He has this new hero, this new character that he's obsessed with. It's called Peppa the Pig. I don't even know where he learned about this Peppa. Um, but he, Dada, Peppa, Dada, Peppa. And I didn't know he knew about YouTube. Again, he found that out. He's like, Peppa. And so like, I'm searching Peppa in YouTube and we watch Peppa. I'm like, what, this pig, Peppa, Dada, Peppa. The other day we got in the car 
And we get the car and Wyatt goes, Dada, Peppa. I'm like, no, I'm like, what? Like, I go, Wyatt, listen to me. Let's put on some praise and worship. Let's give God glory today. He said, no, Dada, Peppa. I said, you are a sinner, son. I didn't even know Peppa had music. I put it into the Apple Music thing. It's, I'm like, Peppa's gone platinum, bro. Like, I can't, I'm like, how does he know all this? The other night, we were getting ready for bed, and um, I had like a whole routine to go to sleep, and, um, you know, I put him to bed. I'm, I'm, I'm like a really great dad and everything, and so... <laughs> And so I read him a book at night, and, and, and what we do is I'm like, Wyatt, you know, what book do you want? And so the other night, this is true, he's like, Dada, Peppa. I'm like, and I'm like, I know we don't have a Peppa book. We have this big bookshelf that's got all these books on the side of the wall. And I, I go, Wyatt, we don't have a book called Peppa. He goes, no, Dada, Peppa. I said, son, if you backtalk me one more time. He said, no, Dada, Peppa, Peppa, Peppa. I pick up my son. He's not even two. I walk him over to the bookshelf. He points up to the top shelf. There behind two books is another book, and it's Peppa the Pig the Book. I go, you, my son, are a prodigy and a prophet. Peppa the pig, the book's always been on the bookshelf. I've just never looked for it. It's, it's always been there. I just never knew to look for it. What prayer does, listen to me. What prayer does is prayer all of a sudden helps you see things that otherwise you would never even be looking for. Nehemiah gets this burden, gets this passion, gets this frustration of what is, and a passion begins to be created of what could be. And his first thing that he does is he doesn't stand there. He jumps, drops down to his knees, and he begins to pray. Here's his prayer, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. There's two things that Nehemiah prays for that I think every one of us, if we're waiting tonight, should be praying for. The first thing that he prays for is he prays for an opportunity. He doesn't pray for a miracle. He prays for an opportunity. God, pray that you'd open this man's ears. God, would you open up your ears to me? God, just give me an opportunity. God, I know you can part the Red Sea, but if you can just teach me how to build a boat, we'll, we'll still get there. Many of you in this room, you create an excuse, and the excuse is, is that you're always just waiting on the supernatural. I believe in signs and wonders. But I also believe that God gives us a mind. God gives us talents. God gives us skills. God gives us opportunities that if we'll be faithful and obedient, he will open up new worlds to us. Some of you need to get on your knees and pray, God, give me an opera. All I'm looking for is an opera. Just crack the door. When I was 24 years of age, I had a chance and I was going up to this conference called the Wave Conference in Virginia Beach. And I was just 24, I was a young man. And the real whole reason I was going there is I, I, I was going to visit a, a, a new friend, someone that I was really, really inspired by, someone that I looked up to, someone that was really becoming a hero in my life. Um, his name was Pastor Carl Lentz. And many of you who are part of our church know who Carl is now. He leads Hillsong New York City, and he's a good friend of ours. And th but this was 10, 11 years ago. I didn't know Carl like that yet. I was just seeing him from afar, and he was a local young adults pastor, and they had this conference going on. And so I fly to Virginia Beach, and I'm sitting like on the fourth row, just like being there. I was pumped. I was staying at like a host home, like so like I didn't have enough money for a hotel, so like I was staying with people in the church. And there's all these like famous preachers and big time names. There, Jensen Franklin's there. He's like one of my heroes, man. And the after party that night was at, the, at, at someone's house and we're hanging out. And the next day, Pastor Jensen is scheduled to preach. And then Pastor Carl is going to follow Jensen. So I'm at the after party, just hanging out. Like, yeah, this is cool, man. I'm meeting all this. is cool. And just doing my thing, you know. And 
And Carl goes, hey, Rich, let me talk to you. I said, oh, yeah, what's, going, what's up, man? He goes, hey, um, so tomorrow, he said, I'm not going to preach. I said, oh, what, what's up, man? He goes, yeah, I'm not going to preach. He said, you're going you're gonna to take my place. You're going to preach. I said, um, I said, excuse me? Um, I don't think Jesus has told me that yet. Um, I said, yeah, you're going to be fine. Jensen will preach in the morning. You'll follow Jensen. I said, follow Jensen Franklin? At least let me open for the guy. My goodness, you know? I was so nervous. I was so afraid. I remember just looking back going, absolutely. Of course, of course I have a word. I can't wait to share what God's placed on my heart, you know? I had nothing. I was freaking out. I peed my pants, you know? <laughs> Kept hanging out. This is cool. Yeah, cool, cool. I'm going to get some rest, you know? I go back home that night, and I, I, guys, I get a computer. I write a sermon. I'm 24. I'm, I'm not ready for this. I'm freaking out. The next day I came, Pastor Jensen lit the place on fire, and then I'm up to preach. And there's been a few times in my life where I can just see God's providential hand at work. I can't fully remember what I preached about. I don't know if it was that good, but I know that God moved that day. But what I didn't know was all the people that were in the room, some of the most influential Christian leaders were in the room that day. And I'm telling you, I left that event. And after I left that event, I'm telling you, for the next six months, my entire calendar was booked at some of the best churches in all of America. Listen, the goal is not to be successful the goal is not to be big. I'm not telling you that story because, whoa, look at my life. God will t- turn your haters into elevators. That's not the story. <laughs> Trust God, he'll make you big. Like, that's not the story. We're not called to be successful, but we definitely are called to be faithful. We're called to be obedient. And God will give you an opportunity and you gotta walk through the door. And when you walk through the door, he's gonna open up a new world to you. Is there anybody out there who knows what I'm talking about? God, give us an opportunity. Come on, somebody give him praise in this place. Just, God, make the king's ear attentive towards me. God, open your ear. Just give me an opportunity. But then what does he pray? He doesn't just pray for an opportunity. He prays for favor. Everyone say favor. Favor. I love this word because this word is mission critical. Favor. It's hard to explain, but I could show you story after story in the Bible that there is something about the favor of the Lord. You need favor. You think you need more money? You need more favor. You think you need more connections? No, you need more favor. God, give me favor. Luke chapter two, verse 52, Jesus, this is New Testament. Now Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, favor with God and favor with man. Christians make me laugh because Christians, we, we have so many cop-outs to not be excellent, to not put our best foot forward, to not to be sharp. Oh, it's okay. God just looks at the heart. Right, cool, yeah. But once you start serving God, he now says, if you follow me, this is what Jesus said, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. You're not trying to catch God. You're trying to catch men. God looks at the heart. Guess what men look at? The outward appearance. They look at the surface. They look at your skills. They look at your gifts. They look at your talent. And even Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, he needed God's favor, but he also needed man's favor. Oh, I wish you could get this in your spirit tonight. I wish that you would hit your knees and you would begin to pray and say, waiting is working. But while I wait, I'm going to hit my knees going, God, give me an opportunity. And God, put favor on my life. How do you know when you're operating in favor? Well, favor doesn't force. Favor's not like, hey! Hey! What's up, everybody? Have I told you my spiritual gifts recently? (laughs) Favor doesn't force. Favor flows. It flows. It comes to you. I don't have to prove myself. I pray often, God, put favor on my life. 
I'm not the most talented dude. I am definitely not the most qualified guy. I got, I got maybe a couple gifts, a couple gifts. I got way more weaknesses than I got strength. But what I pray over and over and over again is God, when I walk into a room, I don't want people to see Rich Wilkerson Jr. But God, I want people to see a child of God who has been favored by the Lord. When you got favor, you don't have to advertise. When you got favor, you don't have to walk in selfish ambition. When you have favor, you don't have to be opportunistic. When you got favor, you don't have to tell everybody what you're doing on Instagram. When you got favor, you don't have to market yourself. You've been marked by God. And if you've been marked by God, there's not a demon in hell who can stop what God has started. Come on, 715, go ahead right there and give God praise that you have been favored by the Lord. Come on and give him praise. He's marked you. He started something in you. And if life gets too hard to stand, if the vision becomes too heavy, if you feel like you're waiting too long, get down on your knees and pray because waiting is working. It's your job to wait. And when you wait, it works. It always works, trusting God and his timing. Nehemiah, he, he starts praying. Before he, four months, he prays and he fasts. But Nehemiah had a second deep revelation, and that was this, is that a vision without a plan is actually a fantasy. I'm gonna pray like I'm hoping that God is going to do it. I'm going to plan like I know God is going to do it. See, Nehemiah had a passion for his prayer, but now he needs a plan for his vision. It's not just about getting on your knees and praying. It's that when you come out of your prayer closet, you have something to show. God, give me a plan. God, give me a blueprint. God, redeem the time. God, use the time. So many of us, we're we're waiting on God, but we're wasting the season while we wait on God. You, you think you're ready, but you're not ready. You're not ready. If, if it happens, it's, uh, you'll fumble. You haven't planned. You failed to plan. <laughs> I love Nehemiah because he starts praying, but yo, this dude comes out with a plan. Nehemiah chapter two. I can't read it all, but verse one. In the month of Nisan slash Honda, It's worked all day, by the way. <laughs> Just want to make sure we're reading the same Bible. Um, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Watch this. The king said to me, what is it you want? You got to get the context. This is like, this is crazy. This is, this is wild. This is a foreign heathen Persian king talking to his slave cupbearer doesn't even believe in the God of the Hebrews. And he goes, well, what do you want? I actually have a vision that there will come a day when the local leaders of this city, when the local influencers of this city will come and knock on the doors of Vu Church and say, yo, what do y'all want? Like, yo, like, what, what? We see you in all these middle schools making all this noise and giving money away to people with no strings attached. What, what, do you, what, what do you want? I'm glad you asked. Watch this. Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. If it pleases the king, let me go to the city of my ancestors and rebuild it. Now, this is just the start 
of Nehemiah's plan, but you got to read the rest of Nehemiah 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, because this man doesn't just have a one sentence plan. This guy has steps to his plan. This guy came out of the prayer closet after four months and he did not waste any time, but he had a revelation that waiting is working. So he goes, all right, I'm gonna get ready for the day that the king does ask me this question, that when he asks me what I want, I'm gonna tell him what I want. Step one, hey king, can I go back to Jerusalem? Oh, cool. Step two, I ain't got no money, bro. Can you pay for this expedition? This is what happens. Uh, Step three, by the way, king, uh, there's a whole lot of people out there that don't like me and my people. Can you give me some letters that wherever I go, it would say that you've given me authority to be there? Also, step four, let me go over to Aspa, the guy who runs your forest. We're gonna need some lumber to rebuild the gates. And once again, I got to broker a deal. We ain't got no money. Hey, Mr. Aspa, can I borrow some lumber? We're gonna rebuild the gates of a city that you don't even love, in fact, that you hate, but I believe you're gonna do it because God is working Step five, hey, Mr. King, by the way, can you make me the governor of Jerusalem so that when I get back, the remnant that is there, that they will know that I have authority and that they'll actually listen to me? Hey, step six, let me gather all the Hebrew people. Let me give them a vision. Let me start telling them what God's heart is broken about. Let me share where my heart is broken. Let me begin to delegate authority, delegate responsibility. Let me empower them. Step seven, let's build something. Many of us, we get a vision. We're like, let's build. You skipped six steps. You ought to come out of your prayer closet with a plan. Prepared to answer the question. Why should we hire you? (laughs) I'm glad you finally asked. Why should I date you? (laughs) I've been waiting to tell you. (laughs) Why should we give you money? How many reasons do you need? I got 100 on me right now, but if you need 150, I'll go back to my prayer closet and get some more. I should let you marry my daughter. (laughs) Well, Pastor Duron, because I got a plan. (laughs) Listen to me. Great ideas fail every day due to poor planning. I know it's like really practical and I'm, I'm preaching, I'm trying to inspire you with it because this church has a plan. We're not just like, hey, let's get, we've got areas that we wanna designate the giving to. We, we, we wanna accelerate the vision. You don't get to dictate the vision. You get to determine though how fast we get to the vision. I'm telling you, a vision without a plan is a fantasy. Six years ago, I was working for my dad at Trinity Church in Miami Gardens. I had lots of different titles and roles working there for eight years. It was the time of my life. Cut my teeth on leadership, had every job in the church, learned so much. God used so much of that season. And about six years ago, I'm at a church kind of conference, a leadership conference with some of our staff from Trinity. And it was just one of these kind of moments. I'm sitting there in the service. This doesn't, I've told you two stories tonight that are kind of supernatural. This doesn't happen to me all the time, but I'm sitting there in the service and a man's teaching and I'm listening, but I'm not really listening. All of a sudden, I get this download from the Holy Spirit, and I can't write fast enough. It's not about what the man's saying. It's about what the Spirit's saying to me. And I, I write down, I'm talking fast. Jesus is our message. People are our heart. Excellence is our spirit. Generosity is our privilege. Honor is our calling. Servant leadership is our identity. Passion is our pursuit seven different values. I started writing paragraphs and pages on each one of these values. It was just like a download from heaven. I came out of the meeting. I went over to my dad. I said, yo, dad, I don't know what this is, man, but I just got this. And I showed it to him. He goes, oh, I love these. We should make these the values of Trinity Church. I said, absolutely. I'm here to help execute your vision. Take it. And it was awesome. They took on the values. It's still their values today. But what I really didn't know was that two years prior, because this was six years ago, our church started four years ago. I had no idea that two years prior to us even knowing we were going to have a church, that God was already giving me a plan for the day that we did announce the church, that we'd already have a foundation in place. Yeah. That's how God works. Rich, you're in a waiting season. But Rich, waiting is working. And if you'll spend time on your knees, I'll give you a plan that when you come out of your prayer closet, you'll have notes and you'll have ideas and you won't even be sure how they're gonna work. Oh, but you trust my timing, Rich. There will come an appointed time. There will come a moment that I will take those plans and execute my vision. 
It's how God works. It's how God works. He gives us plans. He gives us plans. I want to close with this because I think this is important. If you're watching online, we're so happy that you're part of this. God has a plan for you. What makes a good plan? I, I read a post from John Gordon, a leadership teacher. He said there's three things that make a good plan. This is good for all the business people out there. This is good for all the marketers out there, all the sales people out there, all the employers out there, all the people that are building teams out there. He says there's three things to a good plan. Number one, make it simple and clear for people. You want a good plan? Guide people through the process. You want a good plan? Give people confidence they are making the right decision. This is how you create a good plan. This is what Nehemiah did every step of the way. We're gonna discover over the next few weeks that Nehemiah does fulfill the vision. Nehemiah does see the mission accomplished. And many reasons is because he starts with a vision. He goes to his knees in prayer and God gives him a plan. But listen to me loud and clear. Whenever we read the Old Testament and whenever we read the stories of old, we're not studying them to simply discover a principle. We're studying them trying to discover a person. And who is the person we're trying to see? We're trying to see our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the chief cornerstone that our lives as bricks are laid upon him and we build his house. The whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation is shouting out that one name, Jesus. That's why as a church, we have one message. His name is Jesus. And don't get me wrong, Nehemiah was a good planner. And don't get me wrong, I know we got some good planners in here, but I hope you understand there has never been a better planner than our heavenly father in heaven. He's always had a good plan. And what I love about our God is he didn't have a fantasy to have a relationship with you. He had a vision and he attached a plan to it. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Jesus weeps over us. But Jesus prayed in a garden, God, not my will, but your will. My flesh is weak, but my spirit is willing. But God, he laid out a good and perfect plan. How do I know? Well, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. What's a good plan? It's clear and simple. I don't know how you got in here tonight, and I don't know what religion has been shouting at you. I don't know what preacher got in your ear, but listen to me. The gospel is not complicated. The faith journey is not complicated. It is simple. God loves you that he sent his son, Jesus. Simple, clear. My plan is simple. My plan is clear. I love you. You're worth Jesus to God. But he lays out a process that whoever believes in him, someone say whoever. That's the type of church that we want to be, that people are our heart. This is the church for the whosoevers. Whatever you're going through from the attic, this is for people out there that are broken, that are disenfranchised. This is for people that got a story. This is for people that have been pushed out. This is for the whosoevers of the world. He lays out the process. What's the process? Believe in Jesus. You want to know where sanctification happens? Sanctification is the process of becoming like Jesus. How do you become like Jesus? You got to believe in Jesus. What is the work of a Christian? To believe in Jesus. It's a good plan. It's simple. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's a clear process. Whoever believes in him, what? Now he's going to give you confidence that you're making the right decision. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I don't know what's going to happen to you here on this earth, and I don't know the season of suffering you are in, but let me speak some confidence into your soul tonight that if you have put Jesus at the forefront of your life, you can walk out of here regardless of what your situation looks like, regardless of what your season looks like, and you can walk out of here confident knowing I have a home outside of this place. I am called to an eternity with Jesus.
and he gave me this good plan. It's simple. There's a process and I'm confident in it. Therefore, I make a decision. He's given me a vision for my life. He's given me a vision for our church. We are bricklayers. We are laying our lives down for the kingdom of God. And although at times it feels like it takes a lot of time, like the season is slow, I'm going to remind myself, keep on waiting, for the vision will surely come to pass. For I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out under completion. For waiting is working. Waiting is working. It feels like work, but waiting works. Come on, if you know it works tonight, lift your hands. Come on, lift your voice. Come on, sing it out.